What's going on guys? It's back to school month. And that means here at Screen Junkies, we are continuing to strive to educate about film. That's why today we're bringing you the best movies you've never seen. Oh, and if you have seen them, it means you're a true screen junkie, okay? I know some of you are gonna be screaming at your computer, hey, I've seen that. Relax, it's all good. And we've got a couple of true cinema fans, a couple of huge movie fans to talk about it with. First, you know him, you love him, Dan the Man, the Movie Fights Champion, Merle. Thank you, Hal, thank you, uh, very glad to be here. And uh, this gentleman is visiting us for the first time. Yeah. You can find his work on Cinema Blend. Yeah. Welcome, Eric Eisenberg. Nice to have you. I'm glad to be here. It's great. Oh. Well, <laughs> Eric, it's Very great excited. to have you. Sure. So, when we put together our lists of films that aren't as common, aren't as popular, some hidden gems that not everyone has seen, uh, we chose some deeper cuts, yeah? Yeah, but not like... The goal isn't to be like super obscure. Like sure. we're not going to go like deep into the filmography of some Polish director that you've never heard of to find. You know, it's like no, these are the movies. Battleship Potemkin. <laughs> it's like, that's, that's a good movie. Great movie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, not like, it's right. not like great movies that you should see. Yeah. Like these are all like probably more or less mainstream movies that I think for whatever reason went kind of under the radar, were glossed yeah. over, have been lost to time for whatever. Or reason. even have aged well enough that suddenly they weren't really that great when they first came out, but now like they're spectacular. Yeah. So, yeah. Dan, I'd love to start with you. What's a movie that you wanted to talk about? Well, my first recommendation is a movie yeah. called Shattered Glass. It came oh. out in 2003. Don't go anywhere. It stars Hayden Christensen. Don't I, don't go anywhere. For some people might find that to be a deal breaker. Right. Some, right. A yeah. lot of people only know him from the prequels, and they're like, "Oh, Hayden Christensen's a terrible actor." Every time somebody says that, I say, "Watch Shattered Glass." He is great in this movie. It's about a journalist named Stephen Glass who based worked on a true story. Based on a true story, he essentially fabricated entire stories out of thin air, and it's about the kind of unraveling of his fabrications. Not a criminal, Chuck. It's a fantastic movie. Hayden Christensen is great in that. I'm not saying it makes up for how bad he was in the prequels <laughs> or in some of the other movies, but he is fantastic in this movie. Great. Thank you, Dan, for starting us off. Eric, talk to us about a film that you'd like to share. Honestly, I'm going to start by talking about, whenever I'm kind of asked this question, whenever I'm kind of posed the idea of the best movie nobody's ever seen, this is always the one that I go to. It's called The Last Seduction. It's this movie by uh, John Dahl. It uh, came yes. out in the mid-90s. It's uh, this incredible neo-noir like story of this woman who is just like just savage bitch. Like It's just like unbelievably hardcore character. Thank you can also be very effective. Could you leave? I'm a huge old school noir fan, and this hit. She's all reminiscent of, of people like Barbara Stanwyck yes, and like absolutely. some of the tough dames of the 1950s yeah, in this movie. Yeah, it's just super hardcore in every single move, and it's also twisty and turny, as you'd imagine, and it's unbelievable. For sure. Dan, throw another one at us. One of the greatest directors, I think, of all time was Sidney Lumet. He did 12 Angry Men, he did Network, he's done mm -hmm. so many amazing movies. His last movie was made in 2007. It was called Before the Devil Knows You're Dead, and I think it is fantastic. It stars Philip Seymour Hoffman, who is amazing in this movie, and Ethan Hawke, mm -hmm. our brothers. Mm -hmm. Philip Seymour Hoffman is kind of a dirty dealing businessman. Ethan Hawke's kind of the ne'er do well. I can't believe this is you that's talking. I can't believe it. It's so it's safe. Nobody gets hurt. Everybody wins. It's perfect. The great thing about this movie is it unfolds kind of in layers, so you you know things, and then it goes back in time and tells yeah, you the things later. Narrative. It's, it's very nonlinear, oh. so I don't want to go too much into the plot of it. It involves a robbery that goes wrong. You see things from a perspective, and then it'll rewind itself and show you the same thing from a different perspective. And it's not until the end of the movie that you really get all the pieces of the story and you see what's happening. And I think it is an amazing movie. I'm shocked that it didn't have any Oscar buzz, really, any yeah. Oscar attention whatsoever. I think, for me, it's my personal favorite performance that Philip Seymour Hoffman yeah. ever did. They wouldn't see you at his no, house. No, no, no. Nobody saw you at the no. house. I love him in this movie, and I think that it's Sidney Lumet's last movie. I think it's also one of his best. It seems we're on a little bit of a crime kick here. I'm gonna keep it going. Sure. I'm gonna get in the Wayback Machine, and talk about a movie from 1956. Uh -huh. Not the first movie, but a very early Stanley Kubrick film called The Killing. Yes. This movie is about a racetrack robbery that, surprise, kind of goes uh, <laughs> uh, ass over tea kettle, goes wrong, and 
and it stars Sterling Hayden, who's one of the great noir actors of the 1950s. Uh, this movie, early Stanley Kubrick, there's so much to love about it. Well, another great early Kubrick is Paths of Glory, which yes. stars yeah. the same star as my next movie, which mm -hmm. was made in 1951, by another great director, Billy Wilder. He's yes. made several of my favorite films. This starred Kirk Douglas. It's called Ace in the Hole. This was a movie that a lot of people thought was lost mm -hmm. forever. It was kind of rediscovered. And when, when it was found again, people said, like, this is an like, amazing, yeah, wait a minute. <laughs> this is an incredible movie. It stars Kirk Douglas as this kind of washed up reporter. Uh -huh. He literally just kind of breaks down in this dusty desert town, and a guy gets trapped in a mine. And it's about this reporter who is manipulating the situation, kind of slowing down the rescue efforts, and he turns this into a national event. Literally yeah. a carnival. Yeah. Uh, literally <laughs> a carnival. And the alternate title for the film is The Big Carnival. carnival. The Big yeah. Carnival. It's yeah. basically people just flock, and it just becomes like the guy in the mine is secondary to just the scene that's happening, and it is so relevant yeah. to exactly the Absolutely. way that the media works today, which is that the story is secondary, it's everything surrounding it, yeah. and, and the way that the story progresses with the fleeting attention of the public and the yeah. way that, you know, you're a hero today and tomorrow you're yesterday's news. Now go on home, all of you. The circus is over. It's amazing how this movie that was made so long ago and was lost forever is as relevant, maybe more relevant yeah. today than it was when it was made. Eric, let's hear another one from you, buddy. Uh, I'll shoot a uh, kind of a more controversial one, be, mostly because of the source material. Uh, it's a Brett Easton Ellis adaptation. Obviously, that's going to immediately turn some people off. Some people just aren't going to deal with it. But I'm going to talk about Rules of Attraction because mm -hmm. it is the second movie from director Roger Avery, also his last movie. He hasn't made a movie since, which I find really unfortunate because while its content is, again, controversial, it's also completely unflinching, unapologetic. It is in deeply affecting. But also, it's just more importantly, just Avery has such an incredible incredible sense of point of view and perspective. Yeah, I agree. Like, this is a movie that hit when I was, I think, a freshman in college, mm -hmm. and I was hugely <laughs> impressed by this movie. Just from a technical standpoint, I remember there's a scene with Shannon Sossaman and James Vanderbeek where it, they start on opposite sides it's of the split, screen. It's a split, it's a split, split screen, screen from that is completely first person based. And, and you're yeah. following them in real time, and as it progresses, you realize by the end, they end up facing each other in, in a the hallway. same, yeah. in a hallway, oh, wow. in front of the same bulletin board. And I just remember, just stylistically, it's such an yeah. interesting way to inform. And talking directly about to the camera, it's like yeah. they're talking directly to the camera. It's split screen, and then of course it unfolds eventually. And like it's it, it, yeah. Avery's the camera comes around. Stylistic, like Avery's yeah. an incredibly stylistic filmmaker. It's really a shame he hasn't made a movie yeah. since. Sullivan's Travels. Such uh, yeah, a great yeah. movie. Sullivan's Travels is about this mainstream, big time movie director who wants to make the great American tragedy, but he says to himself, "Before I can do that." I need to experience real yes. tragedy. So he decides to kind of essentially become a hobo. He rides the rails yeah. and wants to feel real hardship. And he has no idea what he's in for. <laughs> and if you need movie. an endorsement, I mean, this is a movie that influenced the Coen brothers hugely. If you watch Oh Brother, Brother Where Art Thou, thou literally yes. taken from that film, yeah. Uh, yeah, Oh Brother Where Art Thou, a uh, Coen brothers film, takes its name from the, it's the name of the film the that the director movie. wants to make. I want to make Oh Brother Where Art Thou. But I'll tell you what I'm going to do first. I'm going down to the wardrobe and get some old clothes, some old shoes. Huh? And I'm going to start out with 10 cents in my pocket. What? I don't know where I'm going, but I'm not coming back till I know what trouble is. What? There's a story now, whether this is true or not, but I, I think it is true, that way back, I think in 1997, when the, in the American Film Institute put their first list of the 100 greatest movies ever made out. There's a story that Steven Spielberg called them and said, can you please take Jaws or Raiders off this list and put Sullivan's Travels <laughs> on Wow. <laughs> So I, this is yeah, a great story. Is yeah, yeah. Influential I had too. never heard that. Sure. That's so many great. directors. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Dan, why don't you throw another one our way? There's a movie 1996 that came out, directed by Tom Hanks. It's called That Thing You Do. This is a movie that was, was not a big hit when it came out. Not I did see it in theaters, though. I so saw it in theaters that, yeah. a few times. I've had it on VHS. I've had it on a DVD. I've had it on Blu-ray. I've had it on every format you could have it on. It's just joyful. It's it's about this band in Pennsylvania, this garage band, essentially, back in the 60s. And they write a song called That Thing You Do, and they become, they're called The Wonders, and they become one-hit wonders. The Oneaters. The Oneaters. <laughs> it's spelled with a one, so they call them the Oneaters. That's it. Go, 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 go! It's just so much... Fun and it's just like if you just want to have a great time, if you want to feel like you just saw something just very pure, there's not an ounce of cynicism in that movie. It's just about these kids that are <laughs> rock stars overnight, and it's just a really classic Hollywood story.
Nice. Thanks for uplifting, because we've talked <laughs> about talk a lot about of heavy crime movies. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Uh, Eric, do well, I have to send, send another this one? this right back into darkness, <laughs> because uh, the next one I want to talk about is uh, Yorgos Lanthimos' Dogtooth. It's a Greek film that came out a couple years ago. I was recently just thinking about it, honestly, because uh, he just put out a new film called The Lobster with uh, one of the best uh, movies Carl, of the year. Which is fantastic. It's unbelievably great. And it's, but it's also just an extension of uh, his the director's style, which is incredibly goddamn weird. Just like, because what this movie is, is it's about this family. They literally, no, they don't have any names. It's mother, father, older sister, old, younger sister, and brother living in complete isolation, living in this kind of fenced off compound. And essentially their father has kind of completely manipulated their reality. Like he's completely changed language. He convinces everyone that the stray cat that's hanging out in their backyard has killed their brother and is like this savage beast is, that is gonna rip them apart if they try and escape. Other forces pethane. Ένα πλάσμα σαν αυτό που εισέβαλε σήμερα στον κήπο των διαμέλυση. It's incredibly weird, and it, honestly, it has a very sci-fi quality to it, and it just that it feels like it could just exist on another planet. This next one is from Robert Altman, one of the great maverick directors of the 1970s. Yeah. What a filmography Robert Altman has. This is a 1992 film called The Player. Oh, yeah. so good. <laughs> it's one of the greatest Hollywood movies ever. Yeah, yeah, one of the greatest Hollywood movies ever. It's a Hollywood noir that talks about just the backstabbing, the intrigue, the lies that make this town go round and round. Tim Robbins is amazing in this film. If you want to see a modern noir that really makes a statement about the movie industry, the player, it's a fantastic film. And a very layered movie. There's a point where, without giving too much weight, he's kind of on the run from something. Mm -hmm. And if, even if you listen, the, the, the way that Altman staggers it, because he's always had overlapping dialogue in his right. movies, but as he's kind of sweating it out, like, is he going to get discovered? All these characters start coming up to me, like, saying, Griffin, 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 and, like, it slowly starts speeding up. And even if you listen to the music, the way Altman does the music, the music embedded in it has people going, Griffin, 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 Griffin. So it's like this idea of the walls closing in. Uh, yeah, it's such a great movie. For sure. Dan? Oh, my last one is from 1999, which, by the way, was an amazing year yep. for cinema. There's a movie that came out in 1999 that people don't talk about as much. It's called Payback. It stars Mel Gibson. Uh -huh. He plays this kind of hitman named Porter. And it's a very simple story. He gets betrayed by his best friend. And he wants his money back. His best friend steals some money that they he took together. Payback. He wants payback. <laughs> and so the entire movie is just him working his way up the levels of this organization, this crime organization. And every level has a great actor. One level is William Devane, who's amazing. <laughs> and the next level is James Coburn, who's a great actor. So is it like a video game with a boss on each level or something? In a weird something? way kind it of, is. Uh, it's yeah. him. And, and there's a joke about the fact that like he... He, he the, the amount of money that he wants back is very small. It's like seven thousand dollars or seventy thousand uh -huh. dollars, and they keep saying like he wants a seven hundred thousand dollars back. He's like, no. I didn't. He's like, well, you're doing all this for seven? Like, are you crazy? And it's like, this is it's, it's about it's the whole thing is just about it's the it's the it's just the premise of it. He just he's just on general principle he will not stand for this. It's not a hundred. Man, that's just mean. That's mean, man. This movie has a director's cut that I actually think is inferior okay. to the original version. Oh. The final version is a crime story, but it's very playful and very much a payback movie. And, mm. and Mel Gibson is kind of like this swaggering kind of anti-hero. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a really good time. The gotcha. director's cut is much darker. Mm. It takes away a lot of that humor and the playfulness. Okay. And I actually think that the theatrical version, it's a case sure. where maybe the studio or whoever was right. Yeah. Uh, and I think that the theatrical uh -huh. version is superior to the director. One of the rare so, occasions. One of the rare yeah. occasions. <laughs> awesome, thanks Dan. Eric. Well, my last choice, I'm gonna kind of break the rules a little bit because uh, technically my last pick is a movie that a lot of people, ha it's a, two movies that a lot of people have seen, but it's together one movie that no, like next to nobody has seen, which is Kill Bill, The Whole Bloody Affair, mm. which I personally only, see, I've, I've seen every movie that I've mentioned, I've seen multiple times. This one I've only seen once because I've only been able to see it once. Mm. Um, the big difference between it, I mean, I, for those who are familiar with uh, Quentin Tarantino's Kill Bill, yeah. it's essentially one, it's t taking both movies and putting them into one. And while there isn't all that much that's really kind of taken, there aren't many new scenes or many scenes taken out, but the way that it's put together is just so, it changes the film in, in such a significant way. Specifically, like the biggest move is that, obviously in Kill Bill Volume 1, the big twist is the reveal that the bride's daughter is still alive. Mm -hmm. That's not in 
the whole bloody affair. Oh. You don't actually get that twist until she is actually face to face with her daughter. Oh, wow. And that yeah. comes across in such a more significant way because you're going through this entire movie, obviously if you've seen the film you kind of already know it, but you're going through this entire movie, she has this mentality where it's just like, she ha thinks that everything has been taken away from her and then all of a sudden it's right there. It's just such a completely different experience within that and it's just a completely like, different read for the film and it works incredibly well. Of course it also has the hallmark of not having the black and white fight against the crazy 88. And like not only is it not black and white, it is longer, it is crazy, it is like unbelievable, like I, it's, I can tell why they cut, like it's very easy to tell That's why they cut it. That's such no a way fantastic been as it battle. It's what unbelievable. The other part of it, about it is that uh, the movies are still separated, there is an intermission in between, it all flows better, but at the same time there is the separation so you still get the quality of Kill Bill Volume 1 and Volume 2 being completely disparate films genre wise, and it just, it works so incredibly well and Dear Lord, somebody put this movie out. Wow, uh, you know what? I think I have some viewing. I have some homework to do now. Yeah. I'm excited to dive in a couple of those films that I have not seen. How many of the films that we mentioned have you seen? What are you most excited about? What's your kind of hidden gem that not a lot of people know? Let us know in the comments section below. We wanna know. I gotta thank my awesome panel. Guys, that was an enriching conversation. That was fun. I feel nice. I, I feel like more of a cineast, a movie buff after talking to you guys. Dan Merle, always great to have you, buddy. Thanks for having me. And Eric Eisenberg, thank you for your maiden voyage yeah, here on great. Screen I mean, Junk. Kind of this is fantastic. Yeah. yeah, thank you for having me. And thank you for watching. I'm Hal Rudnick. Hit me up on Twitter. Bye bye. From John Favreau, the guy who went from playing Mike in Swingers to becoming one of today's best directors, to one of the worst, to one of the best again, what does that mean? comes the year's best film about talking animals. You must be the very worst wolf I've ever seen. Which is really saying something because there's been like 10 of them already and the year's not even done yet. The Jungle Book.